saying goodbye to Kazakhstan and Central Asia, we head east towards China. The border is a bustling hub of activity in a remote part of the world where traders from many of the former Soviet republics come to deal goods. We'll be crossing the Korgas Pass and moving through three provinces on our way to Xi'an. The western region of China is the remote area and after uh, 2,000 years it's just a, has the traditional way of uh, agriculture and the trade and almost no industry in ancient time. After liberation and establishment of Xinjiang Autumn's region, the central government paid more attention for promote this area by uh, either giving a lot of money to help the social construction and also by uh, encourage young people to come into this area. Despite the many nationalities that live here, a group of American motorcyclists is an unusual sight and draws a crowd. Getting licensed to ride in China is a specialty of Sim, our partner in the Middle Kingdom. Well, this is uh, different from province to province. And like this year we just drive in, it's much easier because uh, all the driver's license, vehicle's license, and uh, vehicle plate we have done before and so get everything ready. GSPD. It's great to be back in China. I, uh, it's totally different here in some ways than where I was in the east, but um, it's really exciting. And this time I get to keep this fancy license plate. With a little help from our new friends, the bikes are licensed and ready to go. Leaving the town of Xinge, we head out for the first day of riding in western China. Our destination is Arumqi, about 250 miles away over a variety of roads. I thought when we were crossed into China, I was kind of apprehensive because I thought it was just going to be total crowds everywhere we went, but western China is not like that at all. It's wide open spaces, a few smaller type towns and stuff. A lot of the roads have been decent. A lot of the roads have just been horrible. They've just been uh, full rain. This area actually is a long expressway. Uh, originally, it's a National Road 312. It starts from Shanghai to all the way uh, to the northwest part of China. The total distance is around 4,800 kilometers totally. As the old national highway is replaced by a modern freeway, road construction in western China is a fact of life that we'll have to get used to. It was the bad road that was good. The, the nice road is just boring like heck. You fall asleep, you sit there and sing songs, listen to yourself, try to not fall asleep, and that's why we want to drive faster than the chase vehicle, because at least it gets your attention. But the first part was really fun. Going over ditches, through barriers. And when you come to a barrier, I found out the trick is, have the black visor down and you think you are important. And then they just look and they see 16 of us coming and the gate go up automatically. It's great. This is one of the best roads I've ever been on. But uh, actually like the little uh, detour is much better. Fighting around. Uh, uh, dirt and everything. Highway development in the region is an important part of China's overall plan to promote the growth of the western parts of the country and a sign that greater changes will surely follow. For now, it's still possible to experience life in the small villages along the national highway before the changes. Chicken is a uh, very big dish and uh, it's popular in this area and it started originated from Xinjiang and this area especially. Uh, one chicken and together they put some other things like uh, potatoes. This kind of dish similar is now become more and more popular in this area.
at lunchtime when um, Rick was pulling all the chicken legs and the chicken beaks out of the uh, food. That was kind of exciting. Then he was eating them. Figuring out how to say soy sauce. <laughs> Once I get that one down, I think maybe the food will be quite all right at that point. Up next, the city furthest from any ocean in the world. I just looked at uh, the trip odometer and we've done about 8,100 kilometers now since Istanbul. So right around 5,000 miles, so we're, we're moving. With the development of the region occurring at a rapid pace, the population of the Xinjiang Autonomous Region has risen to more than 20 million, including many different ethnic minorities. Urumqi is the capital of the province and the world's most inland city. Since Urumqi is located in the center of the Eurasia. It has the typical dry continental climate with a long summer and a long winter, but a short spring and autumn. In, in this area, there's a rich production of uh, fruits like uh, apricot in May, and then apples, peaches, uh, pears, and the melons, and the grapes in autumn. And here is the international market but it keeps tradition from the ancient Silk Road and here is the the market and the biggest bazaar biggest bazaar in the city and all the people will come in here during, during the day or the weekend to buy things and uh, which include the local handicrafts like a uh, Uyghur hat and a knife and a Uyghur instrument carpets food etc I thought everyone living in China were Chinese. Not so. You take the northwest uh, Xinjiang province up there, yeah. it covers one-sixth of the entire area. Islam is their faith, and uh, they have retained their own distinctive dress and culture and dance and uh, their way of living. Well, right now it's kind of interesting because all of a sudden, maybe it's because we crossed our last border, but it's like, oh, this trip will actually end. We don't have that much further to go, so I don't, I haven't counted up, but there aren't that many more riding days. We still have a lot of distance to cover and a lot of things to see, but um, I'll be home in three weeks. So all of a sudden, this trip that was just going and going and going, oh, huh, it might actually end. I like the motorcycle because it's, I feel like I'm within the, the atmosphere. The, the, I can smell things, I can experience the heat, I can feel the cold. And when you ride, there is no shade, you know, you're like, ah. The most useful skill that I had, it was uh, having a number of years on dirt bikes. And I've certainly put them to the test on this trip here, so. I think the biggest thing is to tell myself to try to ride my own ride. I tend to stay in back where, where I can avoid the, the testosterone, what's left, the testosterone urge to get in there with the guys and, and maybe ride over my head. So, so I, I try to be patient and stay within what I think are my limits. But it's by no means an easy thing to do. You can't just, uh, you, have to have, you have to have the skills, the technical skills, you have to have just the the, the, the wherewithal to do something like this, but you also have to have the mental aspect uh, to just endure, you know? It's like you just deal with stuff. The travelers centuries ago had to go much slower. The roads didn't exist as we know them today. Which way you went was determined by, was there a war going on? Who had raised tolls, etc. When one tries to compare what happened in the Silk Road 500 years ago, 800 years ago, 
a thousand years ago. The travel on the Silk, on the Silk Road then compared to what we've done, I think it's quite a contrast. Our journey is much quicker, even though it was almost two months. Our journey has a support van. We have water in the support van and we have water on our motorcycle. The dangers are different, yeah. We're not gonna lose our water and die of dehydration out in the desert. Warriors and bandits aren't gonna show up and steal our camels, you know, but uh, a flat tire or you know, getting sent off the road by a large truck, you know, same thing. You need to get to the caravansary or you need to get to your hotel at night. Turfan is a remarkable oasis on the Silk Road. Lying 154 meters below sea level, it is the lowest spot in China and the second lowest depression in the world. It's one of the major towns in Xinjiang that remains closest to traditional Uyghur culture. It was an important staging post on the Silk Road and was the center of Buddhism before being converted to Islam in the 8th century. It's also the hottest spot in China with temperatures regularly exceeding 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And it was like 108 degrees Fahrenheit or what, 42 degrees Celsius in the shade. And when you ride, there is no shade, you know, you're like, ah. Many of the smaller streets in Turfan are covered by grapevine trellises, which provide shade from the heat. I think it's incredible. It's awesome. Blazingly hot. I mean, like you read about. I mean, these people under such extreme weather conditions laugh and smile more than any other people I know. Hello. Hello. Right there, buddy. Come on. Yeah, that's a man. Hello. 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 How are you, buddy? Good. Hello. Hello. Melons. <laughs> So every summer during May to October is the height tourist season in this area. Many foreigners from all over the world and also the uh, guests from all part of China, they come to Urumqi, Turfan, Kashgar for visit. The different minority nationalities and the different natural resource makes the tourism one of the best part in China. The relative coolness of the evening brings vibrant activity to the streets of Turfan. A little chance of rain means that these young men can enjoy a game of outdoor billiards. The city street market pulses with activity late into the evening with vendors selling everything from kebabs to more unusual foods. The coolness from this fountain makes one forget about the heat and how bone dry the region really is. In the morning, Looking out over the rooftops of Turfan, we watch as the city wakes up.
This tower and the mosque next to it were built in 1777. The temple is empty, but services are just about to begin today. One of China's greatest public works projects are the irrigation canals surrounding the city. More than 3,000 kilometers of these channels bring water from the nearby mountains into the city for irrigation of the farmlands. Here, the channels are above ground, but they travel for many miles below the surface of the earth to reach this point, which reduces loss by evaporation. Known as the Kerez, more than 1,000 of these wells are located around Turfan, and they're unique to this part of China. Some of them were constructed more than 2,000 years ago by hand without modern machinery or equipment. Grapes are the primary recipient of the water and the crop for which Turfan is best known. Grape Valley is on the outskirts of the city this is a true oasis with overflowing life in a parched desert. The valley is filled with great trellises and well-ventilated brick buildings that are used for drying the grapes. It's a wonderfully refreshing place to visit in the midday heat. Sweet raisins are a major export of Turfan. In the afternoon, we're invited to take lunch in a local home, which is an opportunity to taste the delicious fruit of this rich oasis. Of course, there were sweet raisins and the famous hami melons, but the real treat, traditional hand-pulled noodles that are known across China as the best in the country. Simple, delicious food in a beautiful setting with kind and generous hosts. It's moments like this that make a journey along the Silk Road so rewarding. The legendary flaming mountains outside of Turfan provide the backdrop for the start of riding on day 41 of the Silk Road Adventure. We've traveled almost 6,000 miles so far without any serious mishaps, but reminders of the dangers we face are constant companions on a journey like this. Bikers don't usually like to talk about it, but there is that at, at every given second from the moment that motorcycle is on in the morning, so you turn it off at night, any given second, there's an absolute potential for death. There's an absolute potential to crash and really hurt yourself. In this kind of trip, you might, you might die. Certainly last year, one of my comrades did die. And, and I'm, I'm unfortunately all too aware of that. But, but we've not intentionally stuck ourselves in harm's way beyond the ecstasies of the trip itself. It's not like we've jumped out of an airplane with a chute packed by somebody we don't know or gone over the falls in a barrel. Keeps your blood running and keeps you young and, and uh, 
you kind of cheat a little bit and get away with it and it's kind of fun, you know, and, and as long as you don't overstep your boundaries, uh, you go home uh, upright that day, <laughs> you know. The vast emptiness of the Gobi Desert provides us with a real geocache opportunity, a gift for the next riders who come this way. Here we are at our secret location, Globe Riders 05 Silk Road Group, and the Canister of Love. What are we doing, Chris? Starting a new tradition? Yes, we're going to start a Globe Riders tradition right here on this very spot. We're going to mark it with a uh, GPS waypoint, and in two years, when the next Silk Road tour comes through, they can dig it up and find the buried treasure. We got our we GPS got, unit. We got the GPS. We're going to mark the exact coordinate. We're going to give it to the guys. The lucky person who finds it first. Boy, what a treasure. It's the treasure. <laughs> it is the treasure. <laughs> and they have to bring it back, proof positive that they actually found it. So here we go. And also, we'd like for them to carry the tradition on. So. They're gonna have to bury something also. They have to deposit something back in this canister for the next Silk Road tour to come along as well. So we're gonna keep it going. Yeah. All right. All right, okay. Jeff, let's, let's go. Let's go dig to the top. <laughs> Noodles, you're doing a wonderful job. He's got the digging goggles on too. Look at the camera. <laughs> digging goggles. <laughs> the canister is being placed. Right. And we dump this. Holy. We dub it Pleasure Nipple. Pleasure Nipple. My right. Pleasure Nipple. The old Pleasure Nipple. Uh, All right, Mary. Continuing across a seemingly endless desert, we leave Xinjiang and cross into Gansu Province along the Hexi Corridor. On both sides of this province, there are mountains. So that's the reason we call this corridor. The terrain just like a corridor. And uh, before the caravan goes through the corridor and then stay overnight in uh, this cities. We even call these cities bright stars or evening stars of this area. And this city got prosperous because the location. And only along the Hesi corridor, along the corridor, there are some people living and uh, along the corridor, just a few cities like uh, here, Dunhuang, and then Lanzhou. We're getting into more traffic, more populated, densely populated areas and things. There's such an energy here. It's, the people are always uh, just moving around. Or uh, I don't know. It's it, it's just fun to be a part of. But uh, China's China has been a surprise. It's just been it's been it's been fun. It's just to get be a part of it and see something that's happening. And I, I think this country is is really on the move. There's going to be a lot a lot of things coming out of China. to go. <laughs> What's it like riding in Western China? I've enjoyed myself thoroughly. Uh, the Gobi Desert has been a lot of fun. Uh, our hotels here are nice. It's just been a wonderful trip. Mostly desert. A little nice and warm. Nice, nice wind. A little sand, grit. But great ride. When we ride, I try to control like the, the speed and the position, something like this. Generally, I think I can control easily, but sometimes there's uh, difficulties to handle. Some people you know, like to ride by themselves. Every people have their own personality. Well, when you travel in a group, you have to take into consideration what everybody else wants. You shouldn't just go off and do your own thing and, and hold up the group or cause some problems with the group in doing that. Sometimes you come to a city, you like to just stay a little bit, but on a group like this, you have to keep on going. And you sit in a saddle six hours, nine hours a day. And when it's hot, 
it's not easy when it's cold, you shiver, so it's arduous. We had some stretches where you couldn't see the hand in front of your eyes, and meanwhile you're going maybe 30, 40 mi miles an hour, and you have no idea where you're going. And the feel is wobbly because it's all sand, and do you make a little go a little bit to the right or a little bit to the left? You can't tell, it's all clouds. We had hit extremely soft dirt, uh, consistency of talcum powder. The dust was so thick, I, at one point I was following a uh, dump truck and I never did see the dump truck. And it was a challenge. As it turns out, we ended up with one man uh, on the ground on that particular encounter. So, and we had several other ones like that uh, throughout the day. It's kind of boring, not much happening. And I figured to liven things up a bit, I'd just do an endo. He's taking some soil samples to bring right. home. I can save them for a while. <laughs> They'll be pretty good. It might be mixed with a few fillings, but other than that, they're in good shape. Okay. So we remove my cases, we're ready to roll. A little bit of a mess on these roads. There's construction, so they're detouring us off the highway and onto these dirt roads, but it's just absolute mayhem with trucks everywhere, three wide and stuff. All right. and good. Soft gravel and hard pack and whatnot. I, uh, Took a couple spills and uh, lost the windshield on uh, the last one, and uh, have determined that uh, that'll be the last spill of this trip. So, uh, a few aches and pains, but uh, nothing serious. The bike's in good shape, and uh, but it was just more than the spills. It was uh, just the tremendous uh, tenseness all day dealing with the roads. You go in and off of the paved, which is rough in itself, and then you get onto the dirt. Did my good deed for the day. Yeah, Roger got a flat tire, and uh, I was able to dig up my air pump and fix it kit just in the nick of time. How's the riding today? Whew, ah, oh, pretty dusty, pretty dusty. Uh, and to think that we're uh, doing this route because of the road construction on the route we're supposed to be taking. Hard to believe. A lot of road construction on this road. And definitely the strategy is just to uh, take your time and uh, try not to follow anybody too closely and eat too much dust. Other than that, it's actually kind of fun. In the morning, I was a little bit freaked out because I was dodging the trucks. Uh, but then I got into the groove. And the one thing that happened is the group spread out. There were a couple incidences and I stopped to help and then I stopped and they didn't need my help so I kept going. And the upshot was I was riding by myself. I knew there were people behind me, so if anything happened, I had backup. But I didn't worry about anybody else. And then I started having fun. Because it was me against the conditions. And the conditions were the dust and the roads and the puddles and the trucks and the buses. And I could make whatever decisions I needed to. And I had a great day. Well, we're gonna make it. That's about all I can say. We'll get there. The most important that person when you're riding two up is the passenger. One false move by Benziger and he could put the bike down. However, he has to absorb all my mistakes. <laughs> it takes courage, you can't see what the driver's doing. About Great War, it first was constructed in uh, 2 century BC, and after that, each dynasty rebuilt Great Wall. So the first dynasty, I mean, feudal dynasty is Qin Dynasty. They uh, constructed the first Great Wall. The total distance is 5,000 kilometers. And then the Han Dynasty rebuilt Great Wall further north, even longer. For the first Great Wall, the total distance is 5,000 kilometers. And the Han Great Wall might be double this length and further north. After that, like uh, each dynasty rebuilt Great Wall, there are some other nomadic tribes keep uh, invading from northern part into the central area from time to time. So the war effectively stopped this nomad nomadic people entering to the central of, uh, of China. Zhejiang is a recently developed industrial city of iron and steel production located in the middle of the Hexi Corridor. When we arrived, we were greeted by a local Chinese motorcyclist. I've, I've been driving uh, this bike for, for five years. 100 times falling down by this bike because I, I always go to no roads. 
So is China changing for the better? Do you think it's getting going to be good? You see, my friends, uh, we're getting roughly 20% increase the salary order in ah, farming. Good. 25%. Yeah. The average is uh, 10%. Yeah. Per year? Per year. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So people are going to have money so they can travel now? Yeah. And Even we have enough money, but we don't have the vacation. We don't right. have the, ah, the, the yeah. holiday. <laughs> On the other side of the parking lot, John is using all of his communication skills to convince this young student to go for a ride. <laughs> yeah? This is a Globe Riders Cultural Exchange. Don't try this at home, however. This morning we got up and we're going to have a nice easy day just rolling along the highway. So it started out fine, we left town, nice roads and stuff, and then about, oh, probably about 50 miles outside of town, we ran into this construction and we probably passed about five kilometers of trucks just stopped. So we just passed and passed and passed and we got up and there was a huge highway construction zone there and it was just utter chaos. It was just Oh, it's like ants around an anthill. It's just amazing. People driving in the desert, off the road, blocking traffic. It's so bad that you just look at it from afar and you say, forget it. Is there another way? But there is no other way. There's only one way to go, so you have to go through it. So we kind of threaded our way through and poked and probed a couple places, and we found a way to get, get around a lot of the stop traffic and in between trucks and buses and tractors. After that, it wasn't too bad, a little bit of construction, and probably went another 50 miles or so, and uh, came up to this one town, and we got kind of a police escort, and we came up to the brand new expressway. And this is like the most modern, best highway I've ever been on. It's just, the contrast is just unbelievable. But, oh, you should see, some, some of the signs on the expressway are, are just hilarious. relatively mm, trouble free till we got to the uh, wall here and everybody goes oh we got to do that hey that's the great wall but that's the great hole so we stopped here for some photos and some people are having lunch and everything but gosh motorbiking in China is a real adventure I used to have two taillights now I have one and a half however I think there's still a good connection here and there's still a good connection here, so we'll try it. You know, Roger, yeah, I think if you put a new bulb in there, you'll be good to go. This bike may be made by Honda by the time I get home. We're doing a lot of substituting. You ride all day, and you're really tired, and what we're doing and in the places we're doing them at is incredibly unique. So the moment you stop riding, there's a crowd of people around you. And in the morning when you do it, it's it's great. And you talk to everybody who's around you. In the afternoon, everybody who comes around you when you're getting gas, um, you talk to them, you smile, and you take their pictures with them. And 
But at the end of the day, if it's been a really hard day riding and you park your bike at the hotel, and all you want to do is get your bag out of your pannier, get your bike covered up, turn it off, get in that hotel room, get your shit off, and like just take a shower. And here these people are, they didn't realize, they have no idea how difficult of a day it was and what you've endured that day. You're just to them like this amazing, incredible thing that they've never seen. That's one of the more difficult things for me because I find myself you know, on certain days just, you know, I, I can't I can't explain what the GPS unit is today. <laughs> I just want to shower. <laughs> you know? Life does not suck. Got a motorcycle. Got some all right people to ride with. Life is good. And now we ride. It's a beautiful day here in China. 9,000 feet. About time we elevate this show. I'm gonna give it a shot. Can I just go stop right there? But I need to look at my bike. Can I just go right there and wait? Oh, I can see it now on the group. This is the third last day of the riding towards Xi'an. And uh, people are getting a little touch here. A little irritated, I can see it. Look at my bike. Can I just go right there and wait? It's a lot of uh, energy going in the group. We got off the highway, I think that was good for everybody because we got to work, we got to fight the dust and get the attention on the road and just getting forward. It's like, it's not over yet, but some people have cabin fever. For the last hour or so I've been riding with Genghis John, he's doing a fantastic job as a pilot here on a 650. As you can see, we're heading down a pretty lumpy, bumpy road. We're on our way to Langzhou. And I'd say uh, this has been one of the more exciting uh, back roads of China here that I've seen yet on this tour. <laughs> We're basically trying to steer our way past uh, little construction zones and trucks. There's a lot of dust going on, a lot of fumes. We saw some pigs a little while ago in the back of a truck. So it's uh, pretty much having the adventure of a lifetime. Every day is better than the last. And we're gonna see what's up around the corner because if it's any better than this, I don't know what the heck it could be. I'm finding marijuana. Yeah, look. Look. We have construction all over this place. I can't believe Every time we get off the freeway, we're going through rocks and construction like what's coming up ahead. This is physically tough hanging on. Looks like Bees is taking things about as hard as we are over here. This is definitely not easy riding today, and we've been doing this for about 90 minutes now. But uh, this is kind of one of those yin-yang experiences here. You know, it's, it's, it's hard, and it's, at some levels, kind of dangerous. At any given moment, there's a potential for mishap. It could just be a minor mishap or it could be something serious. But at the same time, it's really fun. It's really enjoyable. We're having an absolute blast. So we're here in China, the land that invented the yin yang, and we're living proof of that concept right here on the road. Okay, well, we made it through this last round, so let's go find the freeway. Yeah. <laughs> Where is that freeway? Come on, baby. You know, there's at times where you're just like, you can find yourself saying out loud in your helmet, holy shit, you know? And then there's at the times you feel the grin on your face and your cheek muscles push up against your helmet and all of a sudden you realize you're just smiling by yourself inside your helmet. I don't think it would be as good as it is without that potential, that every second potential. I don't think any of us would do it if we knew that it was gonna be absolutely safe constantly. If there was a, a cushion of padding around us to protect us, the entire way. We'd sit on our couches and watch television if that's the kind of people. So, you know, easily put, it's, you know, we like to push things a little bit, push that on. You clean yourself up a little bit. This is a respectable town.
Lanzhou is a hazy, sprawling metropolis and the major industrial center along the Hexi Corridor. The city was an important caravan stop along the Silk Road and the center of defense and communications in this part of China. Lanzhou is situated along the banks of the Yellow River in a narrow valley, which makes it an ideal trap for pollution and exhaust fumes. I'm scared, awed, impressed with China. 1.4 billion people with the size of this, with the natural resources that they have, with the work ethic that they have, with the burgeoning growth that they're experiencing, they are going to be a force to deal with. So economically, China is, is the moving power. The Yellow River has always shaped the commerce and culture of Gansu's provincial capital. The sheepskin raft has been in use since ancient times as a way of ferrying goods and people across the mighty river. Today, it's mostly visitors who use the service of the ferryman. The rafts are made out of wood and treated sheepskins. The skins are tied into bags with openings in the legs through which air is blown to inflate them. The rafts are light and can easily be carried up river on foot. Today, motor-driven boats bring the returning ferryman back upstream. The river is fast and powerful, with strong waves and currents, and a journey on the ancient sheepskin raft is unlikely to be soon forgotten. Another important use of water from the Yellow River Peasants up and down the river imitated the ingenious construction of Longzhu's water wheels that were used as a natural energy source to irrigate the farmlands. These water wheels were built in 1993, but the design goes back almost 500 years. Good time, please call to room 2214, Rick. The famous paper airplane toss. That was awesome. Uh, Huggy took about 10 minutes and folded up a paper airplane in just the right way. We sat there and watched him toss it out the window and it did about 10 revolutions in front of us, then dropped down a story and did another 10, and then we lost sight of it. night in China, and it doesn't matter what town it is, every city, the sun goes down, in the city center, everybody comes out, everybody walks the street. There's food being cooked, there's stuff being sold, there's people hanging out eating noodles, people drinking. It's, yeah, it's, so it's a street it's night fun. culture, it's just unbelievable. When you're young, you make friends. There's just this loyalty, the intensity to how you make friends as you're a kid and like in university days. It doesn't happen that often as adults. And a situation like this where we're thrown together for, it's the official count, 53 days in places that are pretty far from home. You know, there's that intensity to friendships that develop that you don't get most of the time. There's a small crowd and Roger went up and got his key and then has been given rides to the young and the old. We've started out with, there's probably been a five-year-old on the back of that up to about a 50-year-old lady. And the crowd has continued to grow. We're going to top the evening off with uh, some big-time fireworks. So we're all looking forward to that. Great trip on the Xi'an. Maybe hot. 104 yesterday there. 
Bring it on. We're ready to go. I'm ready, Bart. <clears throat> Let's get started. We're in the slow tunnel. Wouldn't throw sheet on. Looks like we're coming out at the end of it. That was a blast. We made it, and I'm so happy. I almost want to just jump into here and celebrate. It's been a great ride, a wonderful ride. We're going to go have a cold beer and celebrate. Winding down here, it's like the end of the road, so kind of sad in that way, but feeling good that we made it and everybody's here safe and sound. Absolutely amazing. I don't know how those uh, people did it 2,000 years ago and traveled across the desert and up the mountain passes. It's hard enough on a motorcycle, let alone camel and horses. Now the day sucks. <laughs> this is Xi'an, a city of six million people and one of the most important cities in Chinese history. In ages past, it was the imperial capital and the largest city in the world. Today, Xi'an is the capital of Shenzhi province and the largest and most developed city in this part of China. One of the great attractions here is the 2,000-year-old army of terracotta warriors. They were discovered in 1974 when local farmers in search of water drilled a well and uncovered pottery fragments. Arranged in battle formation, over 6,000 individually carved soldiers equipped with horses and weapons have been unearthed from this site, making it one of the greatest archaeological finds of all times. During the Western Han Dynasty, Xi'an was the starting point for the Silk Road. Today, it's the end of our adventure, a journey that began 53 days ago in Istanbul. With home on the horizon and 8,000 miles behind us, each one of us is free to remember and relive the incredible story of the ancient and modern Silk Road. I think if one takes a journey on the Silk Road, one, in a real sense, gets an education. Every day has been an adventure, uh, something different. The people have just been absolutely wonderful. It's made me more aware that um, we are one world. For more information on the Silk Road Adventure with Helge Peterson, including the live journal for this and other Globe Riders adventures, please visit our website.